Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar organized by the House of European History and hosted by Training Europe. My name is Marta and I'm very happy to support in this event today. Just a practical information for the audience, the webinar is recorded and re the recording might be used for dissemination purposes afterwards. The focus for today is how to teach media literacy to your classroom and I'm really sorry for the noises that I'm having right now. Brussels is very busy and I live in a crowded street. <laughs> I hope you can now hear me quite well. So as I was saying, the, the topic for today is how to teach media literacy to your classroom and I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Laurence Bragard, develops uh, coordinates and delivers the formal learning offer of the House of European History. She has worked with school, youth and family audiences in museum and gallery settings for over 16 years. And she has an extensive experience of object-based learning practice and played a key role in developing the educational handling collection of the museum. She has also facilitated different on-site and online teachers workshop for its winning Euroclio and various teacher history fairs. But without further ado, I would like to give you the floor. So please, Laurence, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta, and welcome to all of you. Have indeed a good start of this school year to all of you. And thank you for joining um, this session and this webinar uh, today. How to teach media literacy to your classroom. This is the theme of today for today. And um, in the agenda, we have a short presentation of the House of European History. We have an icebreaker. Then we will uh, work together on a definition of what does fake mean to you. We will work on the key messages and uh, fake is of all times then the learning outcome and some practical information. What is the House of European History? Well, you see here our history started um, in, a, in a dental clinic for poor children in Brussels in 1935. That is, this is the building where today the House of European History is located in Brussels. And you see there all those children who are waiting for the dental treatment and they are waiting in front of a very large bird cages to listen to the, the, the bird singing to try to calm them down before the treatment. Today, this yes it works this is how the building looks today the same waiting room with the same paintings on the wall from the fable of la fontaine and this is the uh, the waiting room before the house of european history that opened to the public in 2017 it's a project under the umbrella of the European Parliament. It is an ID from Hans Gert Pertering, who was the former president of the uh, European Parliament and who said in his introductionary speech in 2007 that he would like to launch and to open to the public and to the citizen a house of European history. The mission of the museum is to display transnational phenomena which have shaped the continent via European memories in shared historical events in order to raise awareness about the variety and diversity. It is to present Europe's history in a way that conveys a multiplicity of perspective. It invites people to learn, reflect, debate and give their perspective. We are a team of 40 people from 18 different countries across the continent. The exhibition, and I chose a few stops uh, in the permanent exhibition, we have a narrative displays of objects, images, audiovisual material and text in spaces that encourage visitors engagement. We mainly focus on recent history of Europe and it is not limited to the European Union. It's largely a chronological narrative with red threads, allowing different depths of reading. Here you have this, the launch of the First World War, where you have the weapon. It's not the exact weapon, but it is the same kind of weapon that um, was used for the assassination of Franz Ferdinand 
in uh, and that was the start of the night of the first world war and this object is alone in one display case to show the impact of one local incident on the world this is a second stop in the exhibition that I wanted to uh, propose to you today, which is Joseph Coate in the shared um, in the memory of the Shoah, which is a case studies of different countries and how they dealt with the history of the Shoah in the 50s and in the 60s. Another point in the in the museum is this not a fiat, it's a Zastava from Yugoslavia that shows how during the 60s the uh, traveling became much more present in the daily life of European, of course, with differences between Eastern and Western Europe, but also Southern and Northern Europe. You see, for example, here, all the different posters representing the different um, the traveling destinations for different Europeans, but also depending on the rules that they had in the different countries. This is an important moment in the visit, which is the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain in 1989. And it's like a domino effect of all the different countries in the East. And it's represented by film, but we also have objects, historical objects that are represent, representing this important moment in the uh, history of Europe. So the narrative, it is not the summation of national history, as you can have seen, those events and phenomena that have united and divided European in the past. Those phenomena are originally European. Second, they are spread all over Europe. And third, they are still relevant today up to now. Why I represent this display case, because this display case is at the end of the well it's in the section of the first world war and you have objects from italy from france from uh, great britain from america from ussr from uh, austria but and they all represent how propaganda in the different countries encourage the aid the hate of the enemy all those objects are coming from different national museums where they represent this topic in a national context. The difference with the House of European History is that all those objects together represent a transnational phenomenon. The exhibition, I have a short film. I hope it will uh, work, but um, this I didn't try before. If it doesn't, it will be fine. Um, I will I will send it afterwards as a follow up to to have the yeah. Then we can we can post the link then in the chat or we can add it to the material that we will share after. Thank you. Perfect. Very much. We will do like that. The online thematic learning resources that we have for you available on the website of the House of European History. Thank you, Marta, for putting this link uh, in the in the chat. So. Um, there are four different themes on migration, conflict, um, uh, you also have, well, there are five also with identity, human rights, and the communication. They are available in the 24 official languages of the European Union. So when you go on the page that you have in the chat, you change the language and then you will find those resources in your language if you are part of the European Union, um, you will have it available for you. Inside, what do we have? There are notes to four teachers with activities for your class on the different topics and resources that are transnational that you can uh, print and distribute to your students. We highly recommend you to use those resources and give a feedback to us. We will also add at a later stage a way to contact uh, the House of European History learning team. Um, we, uh, I have a learning event that will be happening in November on those different topics. So do stay in touch with Eat Winnings as you're doing, and you can find me to have a further presentation on these resources. Coming to the museum with your class, um, from the 3rd of November onwards, school groups and group visits will be re-allowed again at the House of European History, based in Brussels, of course. We have guided tours in and workshops in four languages, French, Dutch, English, and 
uh, German. Um, and everything is free of charge, the entrance, the guided tours, and the workshops. So it is a trip to Brussels that is uh, part of your cost. Um, we have a thematic approach uh, or general approach, general guided tours or a thematic approach for workshop based on communication or conflict or human rights. And when we do those thematic approach, we base them on the handling collection that you see there used by one of the students in the upper part of the photograph, where he is using a stereoscope, which is the ancestor of the 3D. And we use this to in the workshop on communication. Students can ask questions on these ob historical objects. They can touch them, but with gloves. They learn about conservation and the role of museum in the preservation of the heritage. And then we go in the galleries to see those themes, but with a specific, a specific angle. Online, what can you find? You can uh, go on our YouTube channel and uh, watch some of the video or the podcast on different anniversary dates or also on different um, different themes like the Dreyfus affair or like the multilingualism or something about the Remembrance Day on traces of Max Fuchs or uh, the European integration or Europe Day 2020. So go there, uh, find the YouTube channel for the House of European History, um, participate to our event or do the podcast after or listen to them in a second time and you will find some interesting uh, sources, at least we hope, to prepare your class for your students. And what brings us together tonight is the temporary exhibition, Fake for Real, um, which is currently on display and until the end of January 2022, um, and speak about the current qu quantity of disinformation uh, throughout history. To start with a little icebreaker, I invite you to go to slido.com and use the number that you see here and that Marta kindly put in the chat as well and uh, explain for you what did you fake when you were a student and how old were you? Now, I see that we are 147 participants at this moment. So, of course, I will not have the time to read all the comments that I hope will be massive in Slido, but it will be part of the material that we will send afterwards so that you can see how and what did you fake when you were a student and how old were you? There is also the QR code that can be handy to look there quickly. I will give you a little bit of time. So someone faked their homework. My mom's voice on the phone. My father's signature. Oh. Brand close at the age of 15. About test result, parent signature, my age. The voice of my cat, <laughs> okay. How old were you? <laughs> An exam paper, my pet's name, my age, my father's signature, math results, my location of the house. The price of my brand shoes, my age, my nationality. Don't forget to put the age when this happened to you.
my phone number, okay? My feelings for someone that you faked, interesting. My test result, okay. So you can continue to go to go there and I will come back to the presentation. So why did I start with this icebreaker? Uh, not just to know more about you and uh, how you faked things at different time of your life, but because one of the uh, important points from this temporary exhibition, uh, Fake for Real, is to show and present that each society falsify what is the most important for them. Every era fakes what is values the most. And we could see that when you were asked what you faked when you were students, you faked things that were important for you, like your parents' signature, like your age, or like the brand of your shoes. It's things that you wouldn't need to fake at the age that you have today, at least I think so far in most of the cases. Well, if we adapt this theory to history, we can see that during the Middle Age, many fakes were produced related to religion. During the Renaissance, many fakes were produced linked to discovery travel. In the modern time, some fakes were produced linked to science, and in contemporary era, many many news are faked. So this brings me to the next collaborative and interactive um, moment, and I hope this will work as well. It's this Jamboard that Marta also introduced in the in the chat. And I would like that you you give me your this definition of fake. So now we are in the definition phase of this fake. And I let you go to the Jamboard and add your, so to do this in the Jamboard, on the left-hand side of your screen, you have a little notebook. So it's a square with two lines. If you click on this, this will make the post-it appear. You type and then you save it and it will appear on the wall. And this little square is located just behind a, a white arrow on a red, uh, a round black um, bubble. I hope you find it. And I will go there as well, so that I can see your definition of fake. So yeah, so here you you can see um, um, not yet. I will share my screen. Yes, now here here we go. So the um, it is here the the fourth icon on the left hand side where you have this. Um, oops. Some, something happened. Oops. So how do you describe fake? I think someone, uh, okay, some technical. I, sorry, I don't want to interrupt it, but I, I was just um, trying to type something on the document as well. And it says there are too many people at the moment on the document. So that's maybe why there is an overlapping of, of things, but they should be able to write it. Okay. Maybe just need to wait one second because, yeah, there may be an overlapping. This is perfect. This is what good. I love it when we do animation with Eat Winning is that we are so many that we make the platform, you know, to the edge. And this is brilliant. So thank you for participating and, and for adding. It really, it's, it's really makes me very enthusiastic. So continue. <laughs> So, to the, those definitions that you're giving, giving, so it's really definition, right? So, not authentic, distort, deceptive, when you copy someone, not real, but seem real, falsify your identity, manipulated, imitation, um, something that is not real with the common belief, okay? 
So the 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 post-it they are on the left hand side in the four just underneath this uh, white arrow. It's, it's a little square, and you click on them, and then you will find yeah. Not authentic imitation. Yeah, thank you. To pretend that some something is similar to reality. Uh, changing facts or directing people towards something mixed um, that arch archives uh, or achieves special goals. Changing facts or directing people towards something mixed. Oh, I have someone who has a creative, <laughs> a creative uh, definition of fake. Okay, unreal forgery. Thank you. It manipulates, manipulate, it deceives. False, lie, cheat, manipulate, yes. Okay, I let you continue, and I leave it with the um, with the presentation so that other definition can appear. What I wanted to give to you would be um, different kind of fake, and we already have some hint in your collaborative mind map that is appearing at the moment. So we have different categories of forgeries. We have real fake, we have super fake, and we have ethical fake. How does that work? Real fake, they're like the fake Nike or the fake Gucci, the fake Vuitton. Uh, and of course, the police is actively confiscating those fake. It's 400 billion euro traded worldwide per year. They try to deceive the buyers into believing that they are paying for authentic brand. The most dangerous, of course, is the fake medication, the fake toys, the fake counterfeits. Okay, I will stop sharing because we are having experiencing some difficulties with the screen. So, um, no, sorry. Okay. So after those real fake, we have super fake. These are high quality fake, um, mimic appearance and the use of equal material, right? Um, and the ethical fake, those are the fake furs or the synthetic leather or synthetic diamonds or faux gras instead of foie gras. And people buy them on purpose for ethical reasons. The key messages of this exhibition, Fake for Real, is to explore different intention to fake, and we will see that together. It is to that fake has a long history and is not something new. And every time error values its fake the most and stimulate critical thinking. Fake is of all time. This is the start of the exhibition. Condemn to be forgotten. This is a damnatio memoriae. It's an attempt by the ancient Roman to erase someone's memory from the history through the destructions of public images and the erasure of names from inscriptions. Now the question, is it possible to force the process of forgetting on the collective consciousness through the destructions of evidence and the falsification of records? Damnatio memoriae, so condemned to be forgotten, it's commonly associated with imperial Rome and monuments were destroyed, names were erased, sculptures were demolished, books were destroyed as well. It is a political act used to justify a succession, a usurpation or a murder. Geta is victim of Damanasio Memoriae by his brother Caracalla. And this is the example that you have on the left-hand side of the screen. He's been murdered by Caracalla, who pretended that he was running for the power and that he had to be condemned. However, historian did talk about Geta, 
So did he really re succeeded in his damnatio memoriae to be condemned to be forgotten? Or did he obtain the reverse by trying to, to delete his brother from history, he attracted attention on his brother. And this could be justified with the fact that now it is part of an exhibition at the House of European History called Fake for Real. Now a contemporary example from the 20th century, and this is the right-hand side of my screen, with the anti-communist fighter Johann Pop, torn from his wedding photograph by a secret police officer in Romania in the 50s. The intention was to delete political opponents from history. And again, during the communist regime, the family of Johan Pop couldn't bring his name without having to pay, uh, to pay money or to have different um, deprivation of freedoms. But as soon as the wall, the, the Berlin Wall fell down and the Iron Curtain lift, his family started to speak again and again we find this object in the house of european history today pamphlet and trolling now the invention of a printing press around 1440 increases the number of literate european population having access to books pamphlets and newspapers it multiplies the source of information and misinformation. Why? Well, the lack of content control creates concerns about fake news, distorted realities, and hate speech. From the beginning, there were a lively debate on the freedom of expression in print. And this is what we would like to suggest to you when you uh, tackle this subject to your classroom, when you talk about media literacy, the history of the printing press is a good start because should we have the freedom to publish whatever we want or not? And this, uh, in this debate, you can bring historical elements or important figures, such as, for example, Erasmus, who was strongly against the freedom of press. He was saying that unrestricted printing would devalue the profession, that when you want to be, and this is Erasmus uh, that is saying this, when you want to be a baker, you need to have an access to the profession, and when you want to become a printer, no, no. Now, in the exhibition, we show that Erasmus, despite his beliefs, did also produce a fake that we exhibit in the exhibition because Erasmus wrote a fake writing by Saint Cyprian. He really wanted this saint to be more known, so he, he uh, faked um, the, the writings of Saint Cyprian and published a book. Another example that we would like to bring in the discussion is the story of Johannes Friedrich Streunzi. In the revol revolutionary moment um, in history of Denmark and Norway, it was the total freedom of press allowed by Johannes Friedrich Strunzi in 1770. It is his initiative and he was a royal physician and a very important person and important confidence of the King Christian VI. But this turns against him because many pamphlets were written against Friedrich uh, Strunzi he was so so as a public enemy and his affair with the queen was published in every pamphlet he was arrested for usurping royal authority and he had given the, the freedom to the press and he was executed after his death there were no more freedom of press at that time in Norway, uh, denmark now, if I bring those examples, because when uh, you tackle this media literacy topic, it is interesting to have this debate with your students about freedom of press. Yes, but important to check the sources, not to spam or um, and, and spread fake news, of course. In our bubble, social media platforms are great to connect people, but they also have to create so-called filter bubbles. They select information and expose us to things we have already approved and liked in the past. 
These filters led to an illusion of seeing the whole picture, whereas in reality, we remain confined to a limited media environment shared with mostly like-minded people. Since such bubbles do not leave much room for diverging views and alternative sources, they provide fertile ground for falsehood to spread and thrive. This is these uh, filter bubbles, and in the last section of the exhibition Fake for Real, we have this interactive uh, that you see on the screen in front of me, where the shape that you see there represents me, and when the visitor is moving the arms, he's attracting different bubbles. And the more he does that, the more he attracts, instead of the bubbles of all the colors that you see around the shape at this stage, the more I play the game, only bubbles with the same colors are coming to me. And then one color is entering the filter that is not the same color, and it makes the whole bubble explode. This is how we try to explain those filter bubbles to our visitors. And it is extremely important. Why don't you take different newspaper in your classroom and see one same topic analyzed by different journalists from different sides? And what is important there is to show how uh, learning more and being curious about the other's point of view may enrich your understanding of the situation. This is what we encourage you to do. Now, Han van Mekeren um, is the um, a forger who was from the Netherlands. In the 20, he lived in the 20th century and he made millions by selling his painting as works by old Dutch masters such as Vermeer. He fooled art experts and Nazi collectors such as Göring. When threatened to be charged with collaboration after the war, he confessed to a lesser crime of forgery. From a traitor, he became a national hero. The intention is to make forgeries for personal game and fake and fame and fortune. Now, Han van Megeren studied drawing and painting at the art school of Den Haag. He was a gifted portraitist, but he never received the praise that he expected. Forging paintings of famous artists became his way to demonstrate his talent. When he fooled the Nazi expert and the expert, he did it because he used this Zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. He chose Vermeer because very few paintings of Vermeer uh, survived, but many Paintings from Vermeer are documented, but were lost. So he reproduced those lost paintings, and experts were so happy to finally find it that they were, it was too good, too good to be true, but they believed it. He used the same technique, the same pigmentation, uh, the same kind of wood, but, and that's how he made uh, it possible to fake those paintings. Now, I have a new uh, quiz for you on menti.com uh, where you can uh, join us with the code or with the QR code. Uh, I just added a disclaimer because on uh, that you uh, accept the privacy statement of menti.com, but this is quite um, a tool that's used quite a lot. <coughs> Sorry. Here we go. So I will give you a bit more time to join the quiz. So is this a real or a fake Vermeer? Three, two, one, time's up. Fake Vermeer and correct. Congratulations, it winners. Next.
Question two. Look at your phone, real or fake Vermeer? Three, two, one, time's up. Real Vermeer, congratulations. So then the, next, the, the third question. Look at your phone, real or fake Vermeer? Time's up. Fake Vermeer. Eh, no, this one, this one was a real Vermeer. And the last. Look at your phone or computer. Real or fake Vermeer. Yes, five more seconds. Time's up. Ooh, <laughs> it's a fake Vermeer. Okay, perfect, congratulations. Yes, really hard to distinguish from the fake and the real Vermeer. I admit that also. Uh, but again, as a follow up of this, uh, this training, I will give you some link with where you can have a short presentation of fake and real Vermeer and the fake from Hans uh, van Meegeren. And you can also use that in your classroom and then create this. Uh, it's a very simple uh, pool, you know, it's uh, with menti.com and you can ask your students to play to ask them or to trick them to, to find the real from the fake Vermeer. And to come back to this media literacy, because this is the aim of tonight's discussion, um, we recommend to use visible thinking when you tackle this topic of fake. Uh, linked to painting, why not? Essentially, visible thinking, it is learner-based. The starting point is the thoughts and questions that the students have. Teaching becomes listening, and the learning happens through talking. Visible thinking can be used in all age group and content. What makes them into routine is that they get used over and over again in the classroom. Students get familiar with them, and the routine becomes integrated in the learning process. Now, how do you do uh, an exercise on visible thinking with this fake uh, Vermeer from Han van Meegeren that we exhibit at the House of European History at the moment? First, you ask the question, what do you see? This is an observation, and then you listen to what your students will tell you. Second, what do you think is going on? This is an interpretation. And third, what does it make you wonder? Those are the remaining questions. Why do we do visible thinking? Well, at this stage in this webinar, we are 149 participants. I guess that all of you behind your screen are thinking. Maybe you are with me trying to understand why I'm talking about visible thinking and this is the best case scenario. But you may also be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, what you will do tomorrow, what uh, other emergency or things you forgot to do. And then you're all thinking something different. When you are giving a class, 
your aim, I guess, is that every student is thinking with you, along with you, to organize a kind of a dance of thinking so that all your students, and in this case, all of you, will be thinking about the same thing together. When I do those interactive moments, when I go to Slido or to Mentimeter or Jamboard, it is because I'm trying to extract you from your different individual thinking and to bring you back with me so that I try to organize this dance of, th of thoughts to uh, or have it harmonious with this presentation. When you do that with this visible thinking, the guidelines is that students are shown an image and asked to write down first what they see, what they think, and then the questions that the image triggers in them. General tips for you as teacher, there is no right and wrong comments from students when they do these activities. They ask open questions and they use LSD technique, which is listening, summarizing, discussing. Example of question, can you really see this? Where in the picture do you see this? What makes you say this? Visible thinking, thinking why should you do this to create a routine for uh, critical thinking in your class. Now, headline, your turn. Now, imagine that you are a journalist and you see this image. Write in the chat your own headline. Be creative. End of summer festival. Thank you. Fun in the mud. Concert in mud. Muddy day. Imagine that you're a journalist and you want the most click on your uh, newspaper online version. Dirt is a good reason. Dirt, dirty for a good reason. Woodstock in 21st century. Summer festival. Mm. Funny day, fun and run. <laughs> Happiness is the simplicity of the things you do. Dirty is freedom, mud festival, enjoy yourself. Okay, great, thank you. And you can continue and of course you can enjoy the chat when I continue. <laughs> this is a fun bath in the mud in front of the festival camping, and it is indeed in Woodstock in 2012. Now, next exercise. What will be your headline for this image? Imagine you're a journalist and you want a lot of click. Dance in the pebble. One moment, mysterious woman. The unmatchable, what a chance, arriving of the catwalk, famous painting recovered, what next? Protecting the queen, mysterious woman. The police find the stolen painting. The star is coming. The mannequin is protected, superstar, sacred and profane, waiting to come out, was Europa arrested? Okay, and I'll let you enjoy the, the chat when I continue. Thank you for all your creative collaboration. Now, the uh, title of this image is a participant looks around while sitting in a bus as a policeman stands guard during the annual gay pride parade in Kiev in 2019. Why do we do this? This is part of the last section of the uh, Fake for Real exhibition where you have those blocks with images and then blocks with different uh, parts of title. And you can be like a journalist to organize your headline for the next edition of the newspaper. 
Why do we do this? Because this is linked to snap judgment. I just give you an image and I ask you to bring a title. You know nothing about the image. You don't have the time to make any research. What is a snap judgment? Our brain has two systems we use to make decisions. The conscious mind that we use to collect information and weigh the pros and cons, and an unconscious that's evolved to make snap decisions much more quickly with much less information. In a lot of situations, we can learn all we need to know in two seconds, in a blink, to make a snap judgment. And I highly recommend the reading of this Malcolm Gladwell blink from 2005. Headlines and snap judgments. The intention is to make uses of images to manipulate the emotion of the viewers with sparks and snap judgment. The emotion is the important word here. To go further, I highly recommend you to check the House of European History YouTube channel with the seminar of the neuropsychologist Magritte Sitkorn, and she explains during one hour in English uh, this phenomenon of uh, snap judgment and how our brain works and how this is related to, with media literacy. Because, of course, one of the importance of fake news is that they play on our emotion and snap judgment and they deprive us from this longer reflection that we need in our brain. And I think that if you tackle this media literacy, it is important to explain to your students how their brain and our brains is working, because this will explain to them that if they want to do some important work, they need to stop their mobile phone. They need to stop, and this is also for us, right? For all of us. We need to start doing not to do list. I will not check my phone. I will stop my emails. I will not do something different for the remaining hour, but concentrate on one topic so that I get a deeper knowledge on this learning outcome, raise awareness about how facts, techniques, and emotion may be blended in different media increase competence when navigating the media, increase insight into how different media may be based and how we are influenced by this. Now, before I go to the next, uh, to the next slide, I would like to come back a little bit uh, on this historical approach that we had from the beginning of this discussion, this era of post-truth. We've seen uh, during our, our talk today that during the 16th century, this debate over the unrestricted freedom of print and the consequences. Of course, in the 21st century, it's never been such an ease to, of access to information and the distribution never been so rapid. However, the unrestricted circulation of message of varying quality is leading to a post-truth culture. The definition of post-truth culture is a culture in which debate is driven by emotion and disconnected from facts. Catchy statements are shared, appeals to people's emotion, but expert opinion become less important. What is a fake news? Often described as a symptom of the post-truth era, but fake news don't belong to a specific period of time. There is a difference between the present and the past. It's that in the present, the number of fake news is uh, enlarging and is raising a lot. Fake news spreads more quickly than the um, rebuttals. The accuracy of news has become less uh, profitable than the spread of its delivery. Info shared by people we know seem reliable filter bubble and synchronization of opinion in social media are contributed to the polarization and radicalization. Debunking fakes takes time. Now, and this is the um, uh, one more, but the last time that I ask you to quit this comfortable Adobe session to go to a Slido interactive and this is the number, it's also in the chat, or you have the QR code. We have five questions and you will need to be extremely quick. It will be like a fake invader game. 
where you will need to shoot answers quickly. So I will join you there. Oops. I will share my screen. Yes. So again, thank you for staying with me and for participating to this quiz. So I will, I think we are 30, so I will wait for a couple of more seconds to allow you to join us. I see a name coming. Okay, I will start. Now, four Paralympians run faster than the Olympic champion in the 1,500 meter final. They are visually impaired. False or true? And I have time, so <laughs> it is false. And the answer, it was true because they are visually impaired. So they do run fa fa faster. Next question. Luxembourg stated a military surveillance program for pigeon. Be quick. Vote, 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 vote. Yeah, you need to be quicker. <laughs> false or true? This is false. Congratulations to the a small <laughs> majority. Now, people smuggler built fake Russia-Finland borders post to trick four migrant workers into thinking they had entered Finland. False or true? Quick. And this is true. Congratulations to the majority. And the last one. When COVID-19 hit, zookeeper Kathleen Anderson ended up in lockdown with 70 spiders in her bedroom. Imagine. False or true? Quick. <laughs> and it, it was true. Some people had an interesting lockdown. Okay. So thank you for participating. And I will come back to my, pres my presentation. This is wrong. Turn it on again. So why did I do this? Um, and you can create this poll with all kind of fake or uh, real news to trick your students. Because of course, again, I didn't give you enough time to check your sources, to, um, to, to, to check information. The hand, how to explain this? Thumbs up, what is the source? The source, is it satirical? Who is the author and do they even exist? Spelling mistakes often indicate that the source is unreliable. Sum up if you made these basic checks. So basically, if in the last five minutes you hated me because I didn't give you enough time and you had all the answer wrong, congratulations to you because you are thumbs up, you've been critical and you disagreed with this too fast way to ask you questions. Trust is key. News can be written and edited to be deliberately misleading. Check trustworthy media outlets. The more trustworthy sites reporting the same topic, the more likely it is to be true. Stay calm. Did you get emotional and react impulsively? Questionable 
quotes and images can be used to trigger emotional response that impair a reader's ability to think rationally. Blame others. Does an article point the finger at an entire group? Generalizations are topical, uh, typical of media that presents one-side opinion. Pinky promise, if all your values and beliefs are confirmed, check and review your biases before sharing. If the news story is too good to be true, it's often untrue. What information do you pass on? Discuss with your friend first, think before you share, report fake stories, ask expert and professional fact checker if you are not 100% sure. The hand, well, the learning outcome, it's speediness versus accuracy. The fact that you must take a quick decision to vote goes against the time requested by your critical mind to analyze the information in depth, increase competences when navigating the media. The learning outcome, we already went through this. Um, okay, so I will again send this link. It's, it's called the attention, I will put it in the, the chat, the chat, the attention test. And if you check this on any browser like a Google video, um, you will you will find. Yeah, voilà. So it's called the attention test and you should land on this image where you have different uh, houses and different cars in front of the street. And during two minutes, you will be asked if you are doing well your attention test. And then I don't say more, but do it and, and you will see and do it with your students because this is something that you, you think that you observe, but in fact, we are all tricked. For you and your students, I come back. This is the end of my presentation on the content of fake news. Uh, you may know that uh, uh, at the European Parliament, so I work at the House of European History, but I have colleagues who are uh, working for the Ambassador School Program. They develop learning resource for you, so uh, you can try to find more information on these programs. There is also the Euroscola, um, which to become part of the European Parliament for one day, that you can apply for with your students. You can follow the House of European History on the different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, and you can keep in touch. And these are uh, the contact form if you want to know more about the learning activities and learning programs that we develop for you and your students. You can uh, send an email to Historia Learning and this will uh, come to me. And if you want a catalog of the Fake for Real exhibition, you just send an email to historialearning at europa.europa.eu and you ask for a copy of the fake for real catalog and we will ship it to you. It is going to be free of charge. Um, with the COVID measure, we haven't been able to sell the catalog in the shop. And we decided that for each winners and teachers, it's a, a great tool if you want to know more about fake throughout history. So send us an email, historia-learning, um, and then you will get this free copy. And to, um, to, find, to, to, to close this um, presentation, I would like to have two seconds for you and vote on the, this Adobe. On the scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this program and HEH learning resources to a friend or a colleague? I would really need this because my, um, so 0 is the, it's not good and 10 is <laughs> the maximum. And you can um, recommend because I need this for my hierarchy because they cannot see what I'm doing online. So I would truly appreciate if you can vote um this last time and for the rest i need to thank you for your attention thank you for joining me on the different platform i look forward to welcome you at a further um, uh, next e-twinning event or learning program learning event a new conference or at the house of european history with you and your students Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurence, for accepting uh, our invitation and for running this uh, webinar. Uh, there are a lot of 
positive comments in the chat and really, really nice. Uh, thank you from all the participants. So I will leave the poll for another minutes. But meanwhile, uh, we had uh, a question at the beginning uh, regarding the exhibition, but actually not the fake for real regarding the, the first part you presented, so the museum. And one person was asking if this is also available in a virtual tour online somehow, or they, if they can access yes, some parts online. So for the um, for the moment there is no uh, virtual tour accessible online, but we are working on it. What will happen very soon is the online collection uh, with 55 different objects that will be available online for you and that you can use also in your classroom. And the virtual tour, if you fill in the contact form, you will know as soon as this is ready uh, for you and your students. Thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah, there was another question. Um, well, actually, uh, one comment that this exhibition look ama looks amazing. And then um, Rosa was like super interesting, interested in the topic. And she asked, when is the next webinar about the resources you, men you mentioned before? So I don't know, next event, next plan, what do we <laughs> do expect? What's next? So there is a there is a learning event um, in November. I think it starts on the 12th of November, and you will find all the information on the eTwinning platform, I guess, right? So um, it's it's a learning event of uh, 10 days. So it's quite a demanding procedures, and then you have uh, each resource presented to you with different tasks. Um, and we, in during this time frame, you also have two webinars, one on e European integration history and one on collecting uh, objects from today's uh, Europe and the role of history museum in the society. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Romina is asking, could you write the email to ask for the free catalog? Yes. And meanwhile, yeah, I would like to remind the eTwinners and all the participants that you can find all the professional development events under the professional development sections on the on eTwinning Live. So you'll be able to see all the next events we have there. There you go. Thank this you. is the email uh, for the for the fake for real catalog. Is in the chat. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I think uh, it was a really interesting and inspiring one. I'm sure you found a lot of uh, resources uh, that you can also use in your classrooms and uh, with your students. So thank you very much, Laurence, for being here today. Uh, before closing, I would like the participants to uh, complete the feedback form or at least to save the link and complete it afterwards. And before we close, Laurence, of course, the last, I mean, I give you the last word to you so you can uh, say you can close. Yes, and uh, actually I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, it is to, to say that the Commissioner Gabriel uh, visited the Fake for Real exhibition and gave a very nice feedback at the end of the exhibition. And I think there is a link, Marta, yeah, if you I want. I posted it before. I posted it before in the chat. I'm going to post it again. So it's here indeed. Uh, the Commissioner visited the exhibition and then uh, we had a nice interview and you can find the video there uh, together with the article yeah thank you very much and i hope to uh, e see you very soon yeah definitely thank you thank you very much and i wish you all a good evening bye bye everyone